In the first video in this series on molecular orbitals, we discussed representations and finding representations for the valence orbitals of a central atom. Here, we will discuss symmetry adapted linear combinations of atomic orbitals, or SALCs, which give us the other side of the MO diagram that will overlap with the orbitals of the central atom. As an example, we'll use the simple molecule ammonia, which will have the advantage of relatively few orbitals to deal with while incorporating all of the features we want to discuss. The first thing to do is draw the molecule with coordinate axes. The principal rotation axis, the z-axis, will be the C3. We'll put the x-axis in the same plane as one of the NH bonds, but it will be a little above the bond, and the y-axis won't be aligned with anything in the molecule. From looking at the C3V character table, we can tell what irreducible reps the valence orbitals on nitrogen are in. S is in A1, PZ is in A1, and PXPY are in E. We're going to generate SALCs, meaning linear combinations of the atomic orbitals of the hydrogens. Since they are hydrogens, they have one valence s orbital each. We will use these valence s orbitals as a basis to find the SALC. Basically, we will combine the s orbitals on hydrogen to get representations of correct symmetry to overlap with the atomic orbitals on nitrogen. By choosing different bases, you can answer many different questions about molecules with group theory. For MO theory, your basis is usually some group of atomic orbitals. Our basis for the hydrogen salts will look like this with the hydrogen s orbitals numbered 1 through 3. For this problem and many problems, you can use simple rules to develop what's called the total representation. This will be the mathematical construct that answers your question regarding the nature of the salts. Those simple rules are just this. We will do the symmetry operations on the basis. Then we'll write down a number for how the basis behaved during the operation. If an orbital in the basis didn't move at all, we will give that a plus one. If the phase inverts, we will give that a minus one. If the orbital moves into another part of the basis, for example, s orbital one moves to s orbital two's position, we'll give that a zero. Let's go through that exercise with our hydrogen s orbitals on ammonia. This process is used to create a total representation, which will contain the information we are looking for to generate our SALCs. We will call our total representation gamma NH3. For identity, nothing moves, so each part of our basis contributes plus one for a total of plus three. The dimensionality of the basis you are working with will always be under E. We have three atomic orbitals in our basis, one from each hydrogen, so we will have three under identity. If we do a C3, 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, and 3 goes to 1, so every part of the basis moves, and we write a 0. There are two C3s, but members of the same class will always do the same thing to your basis, so there's no need to redo this with a C23. If we look at one of the planes of symmetry, say the one coincident with the NH1 bond, we will find that the S1 orbital stays the same, which gives plus one for that part of the basis, and S2 and S3 exchange positions, which gives zero for them. So we write plus one for what happened overall. Now we want to find what irreducible representations are in our total representation, gamma NH3. The C3V character table has no 3D irreducible reps, so our total representation must be reducible, meaning it's made up of multiple irreducible representations. The formula used to take a reducible rep to its constituent irreducible reps is called the decomposition formula. The decomposition formula tells you how many times an irreducible rep, n sub ai, appears in your reducible rep. h is the order of the group, the number of symmetry operations in the class, g is the number of operations in the class, chi ai is the character of the irreducible rep, and chi t is the character in your total representation. The sum runs over all the classes, big R. It looks harder to use than it is, which I can prove by doing our example. Our order H is 6 because we have one identity, two C3s, and three planes of symmetry. Let's find out how many A1s are in our total rep. The sum is over all the classes, and there are three of them, 3, C3, and sigma V, so we will have three terms. The g in the equation is the coefficient on each class, the number of symmetry operations. The first chi is the character under A1 for that operation, which is plus 1 because it's the totally symmetric representation. 
Finally, Kai T is the character under the class for our total rep. Our equation looks like this. On the parentheses, I'm putting the class just to help you keep track. As a result, we know that A1 appears once in our total rep. Let's look at A2. How many A2s are in the total representation? There are no A2s in the total rep. At this point, we have a 3D total rep, and we know that we have one A1 and zero A2s in there. An A1 is one dimensional, so we still need two dimensions to fill out our total rep, meaning there must be one E in there. But Here's the equation anyway, if you want to see it. As a result, our total rep for the hydrogen salks is then gamma NH3 equals 1A1 plus 1E. There are two checks we can do to see if this is correct. First, the number of dimensions in your total rep should be the same as the number of dimensions after decomposition. We had 3 under identity for our total rep, so 3D. We have a 1D A1 and 2D E irreducible reps after decomposition, so 3D on both sides. The other check you can do is actually take the irreducible reps, multiply by the number of them in the total rep, and add them. You should get your total rep back, which works fine in our example. In the end, we would like to see the orbitals and know what they look like. To find out what the salics look like, we use the projection operator. The thing that makes projection different from most calculations in group theory and sometimes gives people trouble is that we have to do every symmetry operation, not just the classes. So far we've done manipulations and just said all the members of the class behave the same. That isn't true for projection. Here's the equation for projection, which is done for a specific irreducible rep, A sub i. Projection is done on a specific part of the basis, which we'll call beta. The sum runs over all the operations, not the classes which will give the symbol lowercase r. Chi, again, is the character for the irreducible rep, which is multiplied by what happens to the basis when the operation is done, r beta. Let's apply it to our example, starting with the a1 that's in our total representation. It doesn't really matter which part of our basis we pick for this, so let's use s1 for beta. I think it's a little easier to keep track of the terms in the sum if we use a table, so I'll write it like this, but we will sum all the elements in the table at the end. What our equation says is that we multiply the character in A1 times what happens to S1 when we do the operation. Under identity, we have plus 1, and nothing happens to S1 when we do identity. So we just write S1. In fact, in A1, all the characters are plus 1, so there won't be any changes due to the character in the irreducible rep, so just focus on the operations. For a C3, S1 will go to S2. For C23, S1 will go to S3. We need to do the three different planes of symmetry, which we will call sigma v1 through 3, depending on which bond they're along. Our basis is in the same plane as sigma v1, so nothing happens, and we write S1. If we do operation sigma v2, S1 goes to the S3 position. With the final mirror plane, S1 goes to S2. Summing the cells gives this. From our projection, we found the S1 basis under A1 gives us something that has the same phase and all the same size on each hydrogen. Since this is the totally symmetric representation, it is unsurprisingly symmetrical. We can draw what the projection looks like by giving the orbitals the same color to represent the same phase and make them all the same size. I wouldn't call this a salc or an orbital just yet. It needs to be what's called normalized first, but we'll come back to that in a minute. I would simply refer to it as projection of the A1 irreducible representation on the S1 part of our basis in ammonia. Now we need to do the same thing for the E irreducible representation. The first thing to realize is that E is two-dimensional, so it has two things in it. Our projection procedure gives us one answer at a time, so we need to do two different projections. In order to get two different answers, we will project on two different parts of our basis. We'll do the projection on S1 first, and then apply the procedure on S2. We've already seen what the operations in C through V do to our S1 basis under A1, which just mul multiplies them by plus 1, in other words, leaves them unchanged. For E, we can take that table and multiply by the character for each operation under E. For E, we multiply by 2. For C3, we multiply by minus 1. 
Finally, for the sigma v operations, we multiply by zero. As a result, for the projection of E on S1, then we have this. We have a positive phase S1 that is twice as large as negative phase S2 and S3, so it looks like this. We do the same procedure, only we use the S2 part of our basis. The sum gives the projection, which can be drawn as before. Each one of these projections should be a single delocalized orbital on the hydrogens. However, as written, these are comprised of multiple atomic orbitals. We can change them to be a single orbital through normalization, which retains the symmetry but adds a coefficient to the orbital to change the overall size. After this, we can say we have a genuine salc or orbital. So instead of using p for projection, we will use psi to show their wave functions. The coefficient for normalization n is found using a simple equation, where c is the coefficient for all the constituent pieces from your basis. Our equation for projection of a1 on s1 was this, which we could think of this way. The coefficients are then c1 equals c2 equals c3 equals 2 in this case. Plugging into our equation for normalization gives this. We can place this in front of our projection and call it psi. From here on out, we'll also make one other small adjustment for orbitals. We usually use lowercase letters for the irreducible reps just to further designate that they are orbitals rather than the reps themselves. So we'll use lowercase a1 instead of uppercase a1. We can simplify this a little by dividing the one half through the terms to give this, which is our normalized wave function. Note, this is a general feature of normalization. If you have the same factor on every orbital like the two above, it will generally disappear, and the normalization factor will be for the lowest common factor on each orbital. Now we can normalize the projections we got by applying the E irreducible rep to S1 and S2 to get this. Again, the shapes didn't change while we were normalizing, so they look just like what we drew before, but they are now the correct size. So you might ask, why bother? We were mostly interested in the shape anyway, right? Yes, but there's one other issue that can crop up with projections. All the sounds should be orthogonal. They should have zero net overlap with one another. The projections for A1 and E, from either part of the basis, are orthogonal because they are in different irreducible reps. However, the two salks from the projection on S1 and S2 within E aren't necessarily orthogonal. To check to see if they are, we can calculate the overlap integral. If the orbitals are orthogonal, the overlap should be zero. If it's anything else, we need to make a correction to the orbital. Here, I'll use Dirac's bracket notation to simplify things, but for our purposes, we can assume everything is real as opposed to imaginary. And then we were just thinking about how much the atomic orbital functions will overlap with one another. An overlap integral in bracket notation is simply this with the two salks on either side of the vertical bar. We insert the nature of the wave functions that we found previously. In this case, the normalization constants are identical, so we can pull them out of the integral. 1 over the square root of 6 times itself is 1 sixth. Also, we'll break this into a series of smaller integrals. Now, we will assume that the overlap between S functions on different hydrogens and ammonia is zero. I haven't met anyone who thinks there are hydrogen-hydrogen bonds in ammonia, uh, so I think most people agree that the overlap is zero. I'm not ruling that out that such people exist because there seems to be flat earthers still, but I've never met an H-H bonder in ammonia yet. One of the beautiful things about the internet is that you can bring together people with different interests. Maybe there are people out there somewhere with identical t-shirt saying, ask me about HH bonds and ammonia. If so, please send me a picture from your last party. Anyway, uh, if we have two different s orbitals on our integral, we will call that zero. So s1, s2 equals zero, and so on. If we have the same orbitals in the integral, they will have perfect overlap, which is one. So s1, s1 equals one, for example. We found that the overlap was negative one half instead of zero, so the two salks are not orthogonal as written. We can make them orthogonal using what is known as Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. The idea is simple. We have two linear combinations of orbitals in irreducible rep AI, psi1 and psi2, that are not orthogonal. We want to find an orbital that is orthogonal to psi1, which we will call, for lack of a better symbol, psi perpendicular. So 
what we'll do is take psi2 and subtract out the amount of psi1 that is in it. The amount of psi1 in psi2 will be psi1 times a coefficient, which we'll just call c. To find c, let's left multiply both sides of our equation by psi1. Now the left side is 0 because by definition psi1 is orthogonal to psi perpendicular. I mean, that's what we're trying to do here. So we can distribute the integration to the different parts on the right side, then rearrange to find an equation for c. On the bottom, we have an overlap integral that is psi 1's overlap with itself, which is 1. That leaves us with this, which is the overlap between psi 1 and psi 2, which is equal to c. You might have guessed this beforehand, but the amount of psi 1 that's in psi 2 that we need to subtract out is in the overlap integral. But we already calculated this when we checked to see if psi 1 and psi 2 were orthogonal. So for the orbitals we work with here, the constant c equals negative 1 half. To find an orbital that is orthogonal to psi e s1, our Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization equation is this. The c equals negative 1 half gets inserted and it's negative, so the second term is now positive. Now we put the form of psi e s1 and psi e s2 into the equation. Let's make this a little easier by pulling out the common 1 over square root of 6 in both terms and then simplify. The function needs to be renormalized after all of this. The constant term will just disappear when we do the renormalization. So let's drop it and normalize this. So we get that the orthogonal orbital to psi e s1 is just s2 minus s3 with a normalization factor. Now the question is, are psi1 and psi perpendicular actually orthogonal? Does the overlap integral for the two normalized functions equal zero? So again, we check that, and it looks like this. Let's distribute the normalization constants. Then we can break these into smaller integrals. Here again, the overlap of an orbital with itself is 1, and the overlap of an orbital with another orbital is 0. So this simplifies to this, which is equal to 0. So the two orbitals are orthogonal. Our new orthogonal orbital looks like this. There's a positive phase on hydrogen 2 and a negative phase on hydrogen 3. There's no contribution from hydrogen 1. The three hydrogen s orbitals from our basis combine under the symmetry of the molecule to give three salcs with mathematical form that look like this. The orbitals themselves can be shown like this, with positive phase shown by unshaded orbitals and negative phase shown by shaded orbitals. Now we have discussed both sides of the MO diagram. In the next videos in the series, we will do some additional examples of these SALC generations and orthogonalizations, and we will discuss orbital mixing and MO generation. If you enjoyed this video and want to support future videos covering topics like this one, please subscribe to our channel and give us a thumbs up. We make these videos for fun and as a way of interacting with and giving back to the community, so we greatly appreciate your support.